Uh, We're starting a new series this morning. We are doing a uh, look again at the book of Acts. We have actually taken the book of Acts. When we do a long book like that, we like to break it into parts. And hopefully, by the time we get done with that, you're able to kind of think through in your mind so that that scripture becomes something that you own. So the, the first part of the book of Acts, we looked at, we called it Momentum. And it was really all about the the beginning of the church, where Jesus goes back to heaven and the Spirit comes, and the church goes from about 120 people to several thousand, all in the area of Jerusalem. And we called that section Momentum. And then we did, again, another part of the book of Acts, which looked at how then persecution came in. And the persecution killed this mega church that was meeting in Jerusalem and scattered them all over. And Everywhere they went, they started another fire. And so you have the the expansion of the church. And featured in that is the story of a guy named Saul, who was the persecutor and hater of the church, who in his zealousness for God, in his Jewishness, thought that he had to stand against Christ. And so it talks about his helping with the first martyrdom, and then about how God got a hold of his life and began to transform him. And, And then he became the voice of the the message of Christ, and we're going to then pick that up in the part three, which is really about Paul's missionary journeys and how the the church expands. And the book of Acts is one of the most exciting in the New Testament because it goes from the church of 120 people or so in one town to by the end of the book, literally there are probably hundreds of thousands of believers, and it's spread to Rome, to Africa, to Egypt, all over the place, and it's a picture of the power of the Spirit of God in the church when we're listening. So watch this. We're going to do a little Bible clip from a thing called the Bible Project. If you're ever getting ready to read a book or study a book, go to the Bible Project, or you can actually see it on YouTube, and they give a graphic overview of the whole book. So we're going to talk about just one part of that in the part that we're going to be taking through this series called Overcoming. So we left the story with Barnabas and Paul serving in the Antioch church, and the Spirit prompts the church to send them on a missionary journey, which opens up a whole new section of the book. The story is about Paul and his co-workers traveling to different cities around the Roman Empire, announcing the good news that Jesus is king. The first mission is into the interior of what's called Asia Minor, found in modern Turkey, and it ends with an important meeting of the apostles back in Jerusalem. The second mission is through Asia Minor and then into ancient Greece. And then the third mission is through that same territory again, and it concludes with Paul's journey all the way back to Jerusalem. Now, in recounting all these stories, Luke has highlighted a number of important themes by repeating them. So first is the continued mission to Israel. Whenever Paul enters a new city, he always goes first to the Jewish synagogue to share about the risen King Jesus and how he's forming a new multi-ethnic family of God. Now, most often, lots of people come to recognize Jesus as the Messiah, but some oppose Paul. Sometimes they even throw him out of town as a dangerous rebel who opposes the Torah and Jewish tradition. And this tension culminates after the first journey, leading to an important council in Jerusalem. So Paul discovers that there are some Jewish Christians in Antioch, and they're claiming that unless non-Jewish people become Jewish by practicing circumcision, the Sabbath, obeying the kosher food laws, that they can't become part of Jesus' family. But Paul and Barnabas, they radically disagree. And so they take the debate to a leadership council in Jerusalem. Now there, Peter, Paul, and James, the brother of Jesus, they all show from the scriptures and from their experience that God's plan was always to include the nations within his covenant people. So they write a letter requiring non-Jewish Christians to stop participating in pagan temple sacrifices, but they don't require them to adopt an ethnically Jewish identity or obey the laws in the Torah. Now, this decision was groundbreaking for the history of the Jesus movement. Jesus, he's the Jewish Messiah, but he's also the risen king of all nations. And so one's membership among his people is not based on ethnic identity or following the laws of the Torah. It's based simply on trusting Jesus and then following his teachings. Uh, That's a lot of stuff in a short time, like drinking from a fire hose. But... The good news is you come back on, go back on Bible Project and watch it yourself and get that overview picture. Because we're going to pick up 
in chapter 17 of the book of Acts. If you have your Bible or if you have your phone, turn to your U version. And we're going to start reading right in the middle of Paul's second missionary journey. And I hope you catch not just the facts of the book, I hope you catch the heart of the Apostle Paul. I uh, titled this message, Transforming Words. And we're going to watch how Paul comes into these towns and the, t- the teaching that he gives them about Jesus and who he is and what he offers starts this transformation that changes the town, that changes the whole area. And I was deeply impacted watching a, a YouTube video yesterday. I want you to write down this name, right? Micah Wilder. Micah Wilder. And he is a part of a group called Adam's Road Ministry. And, and he was sharing his story. And Micah's story is so powerful and gripping because he grew up in the heart of Mormonism in a very Mormon family living in Utah. His dad was one of the higher priesthood. His mom was a tenured professor at BYU. His two brothers had already gone on missions. And at age 19, he went on a mission. And he was so convinced that if he could tell people about the Book of Mormon, if he could tell people about how to get involved in the Mormon church, that they would be able to go to the third heaven. And he was zealous. In fact, as he walks through his story, he likens himself to the Apostle Paul. He said Paul was so zealous for his Judaism that, that he went to the point of actually killing Christians. And, and he says, I was the same way. And there's a, there's a verse that says that they had a zeal the Jewish people had zeal, but not according to knowledge. And so he tells this somewhat humorous story about how he goes, instead of he was planning to go to Mexico, but then he had some health difficulties and God rerouted him to Orlando, Florida. And he went in there determined to win the whole town to Mormonism. And so one of the stories is where he got involved in trying to convert this Baptist pastor. In fact, he was going to convert the whole church. That was his plan. And so he sat and he talked with this Baptist pastor about The Mormon picture of the gospel, which is that Jesus was a human being and he worked himself to becoming a man, or excuse me, he was a human being that became God. And now, if you get baptized in the Mormon church and if you follow all of their doctrines and if you get sealed in the temple and if you do all of the things required by you in the religion, that you can be found worthy and that you can go into the third heaven. And he thought that was good news, that you have to work like crazy and hope you make it. And so he was arguing with this pastor. And this this pastor kept bringing up the fact that Jesus had already done everything that needed to be done. That we didn't have to keep working and working. And he he tried to bring up some of the points about Saul's religiousness. And and so they had this argument. And and Micah left in kind of a huff. And as he was ready to leave the door, the pastor said one thing to him. He said, would you do me a favor? Would you go back and read the New Testament like a child without any preconceived notions just read the new testament and micah in sharing his story got choked up as he started saying that for the next 18 months while he's on his mormon mission he started reading the transforming words of the new testament and he starts reading that jesus already loves him that he doesn't have to be worthy he doesn't have to work at it that that jesus already loves him And he starts reading that all of the religious works, Paul says that all of those things I did that were religious, they don't amount to anything more than a pile of dirty rags. And he started reading about what Jesus did when he died on the cross and that he had paid for all of the sins and that, that that work was completed. We don't have to pay for our own sins. And that Jesus rising from the dead was proof that it was true. And he said, I wrestled and I wrestled and I wrestled and I wrestled. And two weeks before he was done with his Mormon mission, he came to the conclusion that the New Testament was teaching a different gospel and that he surrendered his life to Christ and received the Holy Spirit and he all of a sudden had life in him, not a religion of works and doing. And of course, what do you do then? He's got a... a girlfriend back in Utah who is very Mormon. He's got a tenured mom at BYU. He's got his brothers and his parents and the whole group of people he's on this mission with. And he says in great fear, 
at the end, they had to debrief, and he had to stand up in front of the rest of the people who had been on a mission and tell about what had happened while you were on your mission. And he said, with great fear, I got up and I told them that I had found that Jesus loves me and that my life can be saved and that I can be transformed simply by believing in Jesus and not by doing all of the things and that there's nobody that has to come between me and God. And of course, he got in big trouble right away and they talked to him and tried to convince him otherwise and then they, they told his parents that he had the spirit of the devil and they, they sent him home from his mission. In fact, he said, the worst insult they threw at me was, you sound like a Baptist. <laughs> and he goes home and he sits down with his parents and he tries to tell them what God has done in his life. And, and of course you can imagine the turmoil and the whole thing that's gone in this family. And the fast forward, spoiler alert, is now... Most of that family go around with this ministry called Adam's Road Ministry, and they talk to Mormons, and they talk to Christians about how to talk to Mormons. But his mom has written a book now called Unveiling Grace. And this transformation, but you know what impacted me not was just not that story, but as he's talking about it, and he shared his story many times, obviously, but as he reads the verses about what Jesus has done, he gets choked up, and he goes back through. And I realized what I said a little earlier is how easy it is for us to have the gospel get to be old news. It's not good news, it's just what we already know. And no longer do we see it as transforming in our lives every day, and no longer do we see it as the only hope of the world, and the only hope of the de church people around us, or the very religious people around us. We just get into a rut, and we just are going through the motions. And I want us to look at the book of Acts and to say, God, how did you transform the world through a few bold people? And what can you do in Douglas County because you stir us up to not only have the kind of faith that they have, but to have the power to use the transforming words of the gospel. So let's look at chapter 17 and let God challenge our hearts. Let me give you just a little bit of background. This, where we are in the Bible as we try to teach you to know your Bible, here's the whole Old Testament going from back when God calls Abraham, and that's the beginning of the Jewish people, all the way through, there are all kinds of prophets and scriptures and stories that are pointing to the fact that there's going to come this amazing event where Jesus, the Messiah, who is God in the flesh, comes and lives on our planet. And the New Testament takes up less than this time. And, and you see the life of Jesus and the church that's exploding. And now we are in this process where this message, the transforming words of the gospel, are impacting the world. So here's a, an installment on that. Paul, in chapter 17, and his companions are traveling through Asia Minor. It says, when Paul and his companions ha had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. And as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. You see, Paul was going, every time he went to a place, he started with the Jewish core of that city. And he would tell them that this promise that they'd been waiting for, it had come. But they were expecting a king who would come in and kick out the Romans and be a, an earthly king. And he had to say to them, Oh no, let's look at Isaiah. Let's look at Psalm 22. Let's look at some places that show you that this, this Messiah had to come and to suffer and to die to pay for the sins of the world. So this was his plan. He went into a town and he would share with them the transforming words of the gospel. Now, he says, this Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah. And the response, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. That's the good news. The other part of the story is everywhere he went, there was a riot. Within a few weeks, he would create a reaction. So where is this? Let's give you a little more context. We are over here on the West Coast, and if we are to go around the world to what is now modern Turkey, it was called Asia Minor in those days. Uh, Greece is right here. Little town of Thessalonica is right there. Um, it's very easy. If you look for it on the map, it's now called Thessaloniki. Same city, same town, same name. And then if you go about 70 miles directly west, there is another town called Berea. 
And I want to use the contrast that's mentioned in Acts chapter 17 of those two towns about how do we respond to the transforming words that Christ has given us, that Paul was giving to them. So let's continue on with our reading of Acts chapter 17. So some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. Then verse 5, but other Jews were jealous, and so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. They formed a mob and started a riot in the city. And then they go in and they grab the synagogue ruler and they take him out and they beat him and they do a bunch of things. But basically what happens in this scenario is Paul gets run out of town on a rail. He actually escapes, gets runs out ahead of the crowd. And there is this intense reaction. So as we look at Paul's life, you can see that he has a strategic plan. God called the Apostle Paul. He gave him the message when he struck him down on the road, when he was on his way to throw more Christians in jail. The light of heaven appeared to him, and Jesus said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul's na Paul's name was Saul to begin with, and, and he said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And in that moment, the transforming words of the gospel began to come into the, this very religious, very zealous life of the Apostle Paul. And so he now has been commissioned, and uh, I call him the Star Trek evangelist. Pa Paul's mission was to boldly go where no man had ever gone before. And that was his passion, not to, to go to where there were already churches, but to go into this brand new scenario. And, and I think as I look through that, what was the the power behind his life. And I think of the, the thing I was sharing with you earlier, that, that it's easy for us to forget the passion of the gospel. And when you look at Paul's life, there was a passion there because he had experienced such dramatic life change and because he had seen the transforming words of the story about Jesus change other people's lives. And as I thought about Paul's passion and Paul's story, I thought, what a, what a perfect um, story he has because Paul was raised in a Jewish culture he had followed all the laws he had followed a, a, a famous rabbi named Gamaliel he had all these influences in his life and he says as to the law I was faultless so he first goes to the Jewish core of the city and because the Jews had been scattered all across the the Roman Empire there was in every town a little group of Jewish people. Some of them were in a Bible study like we saw in Philippi. Some of them actually have a synagogue. So you have, if you have 10 Jewish males, you can create a synagogue. So like their little church. And he would go and he would open up the Old Testament, which they were familiar with. And they should have been prepared to hear the, the good news that the Messiah had come. And so he would go and he had a great way of entering into that saying, I've understood the Jewish background that you have. I can show you from the Old Testament. And he would share with them. And, and here's the essence of the message. No matter how good you think you are, no matter how religious you have been, you are lost and you need to accept Jesus. You see, I, I think that's a powerful piece in the message today. There are many people in our culture that think, oh, I'm pretty good. I'm better than the average. I haven't killed anybody. I don't do too bad of things. And they're falling under that vague idea that I believe in God. I pray once in a while. I'm not a bad person. I'll probably make it to heaven. And Paul would say in very strong terms, no matter how good you think you are or how religious you have been or how hard you work at it, you cannot save yourself. You're lost. And if you stay lost, you're on your way to hell and you need Jesus. But you know the other part of Paul's wonderful story? Is that there are also a group of people who think, I am too bad, I could never get saved. Oh, you don't know what I've said. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I think about. I'm not a church kind of person. I, I can't get saved. And Paul could say to them, let me tell you my story. I killed people because of their religion. I threw people in jail, and I, I don't think as long as Paul lived, he ever got over the image of them throwing rocks at Stephen and seeing the rocks crush his head and kill him. I, I don't think he ever got past. And so Paul could also say to them, no matter how bad you are, Jesus can save you. 
What a powerful message. So, so he had not only the passion, he has this process of sharing. And so he would go to the Jewish core and, and he would share with them. And in this case, it says he reasoned with them three weeks in a row. On three Sabbaths, he went to talk to them about Jesus and showing them from the scriptures. And then when he gets kicked out of there, invariably, he goes across town and he starts talking to the Gentiles. And you see, I think the two parts of Paul's story fit perfectly with those two audiences. To the Jewish people, he could say, I'm more Jewish than any of you, but I need Jesus. And to the people who are Gentiles, he could say, you know, no matter what you've done and no matter what has been a part of your life, you cannot be too bad that God can't save you. And I would say for us who are here and those who are watching online and the other campuses, some of you are in those two places today. For some of you, you've come to church, you've heard about Jesus, you've been a part maybe of a life group, you've taken in a lot of information, but you've never crossed the line of surrendering your life to Jesus. And maybe you think you're good enough, and Paul would say to you, don't even go there. And some of you think maybe you're too bad, and Paul would say, the grace of Christ is sufficient. And so I don't know if all of you are sure that you have given your life to Christ and you've been born again and that God has come in to transform you. But if you haven't, what a great day today would be if you chose to follow Christ today. And everyone who says, no, Paul, I think I am clear about my salvation. My question to you is, so what's your plan? You see, everybody who's been entrusted with these transforming words of the gospel, it's not for us to grab and hold on to and sit on. It's for us to share. And quite often the lie goes, well, that's for pastors and missionaries and people who are eloquent. Where in the Bible do you see that? The scriptures are clear that everybody who's been transformed by this message of Jesus, it's up to us now to take it to your circle of influence, to your family, to your neighborhood, to your school, to your work. That God's put you there to be a light. And the same transforming words that change the town of Thessalonica will change the town where you live, will change the, the, the place where you are. And so we need to ask ourselves, do I have that passion? Do I understand that what we've been given is greater than the cure for cancer? And why would I sit on it? And, and maybe the question in your mind is, well, how do I do that? And, and I think that it's good for us to talk about ideas. And, and there's a very simple idea we shared, uh, I think it was two years ago. Somebody mentioned that one of the things they like to do when all they do their holiday baking is they make a bunch of packages. And some of them included a, a card with it. Some of them just took a package of cookies. And they went to five or six of their neighbors or friends. How simple is that? But somehow by sharing that idea, there were several people that were empowered to say, well, I could do that. If you talk about going in and reasoning in the synagogue and preaching the message, it's like, nope, can't do that. Can you bake cookies? Can that be an entrance into a relationship with somebody that maybe you can invite to our Christmas services, that maybe you can be a part of seeing them come step at a time? But, but my question is, does that even occur to us? Does that something that when you look at the neighborhood you're in and the friendship circles you're around, even family members, are you praying for them? Are you encouraging them? Are you engaging in acts that show them the love of God? Are you ever bringing up the name of Jesus and what he's done in your life? And you said, well, well some of them might not respond well. <laughs> and I think, tell that to Paul. Some of them don't respond well, pretty sure. In fact, when people come to faith in Christ, they say, do I have to get rid of my old friends? And I just tell them, no, you just talk about Jesus and your friends will sort themselves out. <laughs> and some of your friends may be interested and they may be curious about what's changed your life and what God has done in you. And some of your friends will say, no, thank you. I'm going to cut you out of my friendship circle. You don't have to get rid of them. They'll get rid of you. And the friends that God gives you will be more, more than worth the the stand that you take for him. So, how do we build that passion? You say, Paul, you're talking to me. I know that I should be more involved in caring for people that are lost, but I just don't have that passion. And I think, as I read through this passage, that there are some clues in the next town where Paul goes about how we can build that passion and renew that passion and stir our hearts up so that we are 
red hot instead of lukewarm. And the next town is Berea. So, verse 10. It says, as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, remember he's just been run out of town by a riot. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. <laughs> now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. Did you, did you catch this part here? It says they were of more noble character. So it compares these two towns, and it says, For they received the message with great eagerness. They examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. I believe one of the things that will build that passion in you, will, will encourage you to have a heart for the people that God has a heart for, is if you... Make a commitment to read God's word for yourself. Not, not just opening and going, okay, let's read right here. But beginning to have a plan where you not only open God's word, but you begin to learn how to get the meaning out of God's word. And this picture says that they received the message with great eagerness. When I talk to you about reading the Bible or studying the Bible, is there an eagerness in you? I will tell you that the spirit of God in you wants you to be eager for the words of God and that when we are filled with the Spirit there's a desire not just to know you know I've read the Bible enough that I rarely learn something I didn't know but it nourishes and feeds my soul and it helps me see people differently and it it feels that it feeds that passion so it says they they received it with great eagerness they examined the scriptures every day they dug in and said Paul you mentioned Isaiah I'm gonna go and read in my own scroll I'm going to check this out. And as a result, many of them believed. And I want to give you three simple steps about how you can get more out of the Bible. And you may have heard them before, or this may be new. Observation, interpretation, application. So let's walk through those briefly. And I actually included a sheet in your programs that goes through in much greater detail. Don't read it now. But after you go, you can take some of the things that we're saying here in brief, and maybe you can dig in a little deeper. So observation, it means we have to look carefully and say, what does it actually say? So let me show you why it's important to understand the context. How do you see the verse you're looking at, and how do I understand it? So help me out here. What does this look like? Cake, pencil, I thought it was an orange skin the first time I saw it. It helps a lot if you back up a little bit. Whoever said pencil got it right. So you not only need to see your verse, you need to understand it within the paragraph and within the chapter, how it's in context. What do you think this is? Right-o, apple stem. But you have to back up to be able to be really clear about what it is. Sometimes you need to know what the whole book is about, who it's written to, what the occasion of its writing was, who the author was, because what we're looking for in observation, listen carefully, is what did the original author mean to the original audience? And once you answer that question, you can move on. What do you think this is? Oh man, somebody got that one right off. Oreo cookies, maybe it's because you're more familiar. As we were walking through this in our filming, Somebody pointed out, this has a hair on it. <laughs> oh, you went from what? Oh. Is it important to notice carefully? If you're looking for a hair, it might be important to notice carefully. You see, we need to know not only how God's verse fits in to that chapter in that book, we need to know how it fits into the whole story of God, don't we? So when you are observing, you won't know all of that to begin with, but the process where you begin to unpack and learn about it leads us to the next step, which is interpretation. What does it mean? And way too often, people grab a verse and they run right off to how am I going to do it in my life or not do it in my life without understanding what the meaning is. Let me give you a silly example. Here's a verse from Jesus. 
Jesus said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. You should only fish on the right side of the boat. Jesus said so. You see how we take something without understanding the context, we jerk it out and we make some kind of a silly understanding of that. Let me give you one that's a little more serious. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, there, There's no resurrection. What will those do who are baptized for the dead? And if the dead were not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And from this one verse, which is mentioned nowhere else in the Scripture, there is a group of people that's taken millions, literally, of individuals who then get all ready and they get baptized in the name of a dead relative, thinking that somehow in the afterlife, this gives them a chance to make some progress towards the third heaven. There are hours and millions of people involved in an activity based on a false understanding of this verse. Let me show a little observation here that would help you. Paul is arguing that the, this new church in Corinth, some of them have heard that there's really no resurrection from the dead. And if you know your Bible history, you know that there were two groups called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the Pharisees believed in a resurrection and the Sadducees didn't. And maybe some of them were involved in now this new life in Christ. And Paul says, and he gives a whole bunch of reasons why they should believe in the resurrection, including the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. And then he mentions this, but he says, what will those do, not you, not us, those people, who, and why are they baptized for them? And in the context, he's saying there's some group of people, and we're not even sure who they are or what they did, but obviously that they were not connected to the church at Corinth, and he says even those guys believe in, the baptism, or believe in resurrection because they get baptized for the dead. So he's not encouraging them to do it. He's not saying he does it. He's saying there's some group of people that do it. So why wouldn't you, and the point is, believe in a resurrection. The point is not getting baptized for the dead. See how people grab one little piece and they say it's in the Bible and then they make a whole religion out of it without understanding what the Scripture's saying. It's critically important that we observe carefully and that we interpret accurately. Here's another example. People say you shouldn't have tattoos. It's in the Bible. It says in Leviticus 19, do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourself. I am the Lord. See? No tattoos. And I encourage you to read the rest of the chapter. The rest of the chapter talks about how we sacrifice animals. And then it also says, don't plant your field with two kinds of seed and don't wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. I don't hear anybody having a conviction about cotton and polyester. You see, we, we like to grab and cherry pick something that we want or don't want instead of saying, well, if you're going to grab one, then you better take the whole chapter. And what we're looking for in this interpretation is eternal principles. So listen carefully. This is, the, this is what you're doing. What did it mean in the original context with the original author? What was he saying in his culture? And then what are those eternal principles usually that are repeated a number of times in Scripture, and then how does that apply to my life today? Now, I'll give you an example. We talked about what we do with our bodies. In the New Testament, the Scripture clearly says, your bodies are what? Temple of the Holy Spirit. Are we supposed to be mindful of the fact that the Spirit lives in us and that this body is a gift from God? What are we supposed to do with our bodies? We're supposed to honor and glorify God. So whatever you put on your body, whatever you put in your body, whatever you do with your body should be glorifying to God. That's the eternal principle, isn't it? And how you understand that, you have to wrestle through the specifics. So you, you see what the eternal principle is, and then you begin to say, how does that affect my life? That's the process of interpretation. And then the third step is application. So Observation is what did it say? Interpretation is what does it mean? Application is, so how then should we live? What, what should we do from this? And I'll tell you something that, that concerns me in my own life and concerns me in our church is I think it's really, really easy 
to learn and learn and learn, to go to a message and say, oh, that was good, or, or to agree and say, I really believe that. And to walk out and 24 hours later, you can't even remember what you heard and you have no intent of doing anything about it. It's easy for us, I think, to become intellectual agreeers with the Bible without having a deep intention to say, God, use your scripture to make me more like Jesus. Wherever you are, and, and honestly, the older we get as believers, sometimes we, we believe we've arrived. We never say that out loud. We just act like it. Like I'm finished, I'm okay, I'm done. Instead of I'm growing and learning and I, God, work in me because I need it desperately. And so I would ask you that serious question. How serious do you intend to take the things that you learn from Scripture and put them into your daily life? If you have a passion for God, if that passion boils over into a deep desire to share with people who do not yet have a relationship with Christ, and I want to do anything to sort of encourage them to take those steps, if that becomes something important and central to you, how do I take those stories about Paul and his passion and his, his plan, and how do I say, God, if you've called me to this life, then you will give me the power to do it. And what can I do in my family, my neighborhood, my school? What can I do to be an influence for Jesus? And you see, I think if every single one of us took this seriously, Douglas County would never be the same. Are there people around us that are lost and dying? Are there people whose marriages are falling apart and kids are rebelling and they are caught in addictions and caught in painful experiences of the past? Oh, yeah. When we get ready to go into South County, people say there's a, a lot of people down there that are hurting. And I thought, how is that different from Sutherland? How is that different from Green? And you know, I'm glad we're not back in the Bible Belt where there are more Baptists than there are people. You know, it's like where there's churches on every corner. We're in the place where there's a lot of darkness, aren't we? And in the darkness, the light can shine best, but it's also intimidating. And God wants to use each one of us to be a light in the darkness. And I will guarantee you that some of the same things will happen. Everywhere Paul went, he shared the transforming words about Jesus. And some believed, and they had eternal life. And some rejected and attacked him. Is that a risk that we take? I doubt anybody's going to stone you. But they might cut you off their Christmas card list. They might talk about you behind your back. They might refer to you as the Bible thumper or some equally unexciting title. And you know what the apostles said? They thanked God that they had been counted worthy to suffer for the name. I think we need that kind of passion and that kind of faith. Because we live in a dark world which is without Christ going to hell. And so my challenge for you is that you ask God to stir up that heart in you. Because he's given us the words that will bring people to life. I'd like to hand off to our South Umpqua campus. This guy is there and to the Green Campus. Pastor Craig is there. And as you give him these last two challenges, God bless you. What are you going to do with this? I want to encourage you, first of all, to say, God, I want you to increase my passion. I want you to increase my outreach. I want you to implant in me not only desire, but ideas about how do I make a difference. Because all of us know people that need Jesus. We live in a community that's de-churched and a largely sort of indifferent to the gospel. Then there are people who've been hurt by churches, people who've dropped out of churches. There's a lot of people that need Jesus. And instead of saying, what should the church do? And the church is going to have some wonderful outreach programs. We, we talked about all the outreaches we're going to do for 2019. But I, I'm more interested in what are you doing and what is your family doing as well. And I believe that the way to build that passion is to make a renewed commitment to the transforming words of Jesus. To get back in and say, I need the scriptures to tell me what's true and right and to keep me focused and 
to keep me motivated. And so I encourage you to make a renewed commitment to say, God, I want your words to be in me and your words to come out of me. Father, thank you for your life in us, the transforming words you've given us, the the challenge that you've given us to be lights in the world. And as we have a bumper sticker on our car, or we have a Bible in our locker, or we have a, a way of sharing that we belong to you, give us courage, give us an ability to overcome our fears. And Father, if there's anybody here today that's never made that surrender to give their lives to you and experience the new birth, I pray right now in the quietness of this moment that you would give them the power to say, Jesus, please forgive my sins and come into my life. I, I want to follow you. I want to be saved. I want to live forever. And in the quietness and the excitement of that moment, that they would surrender their lives to you. Father, help our church to be about focused, focused on you and focused on people that are lost. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really, and so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So... If you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.